Good morning and welcome to the Phototech talk number 29 on um, panoramic photography. Today I have the pleasure of introducing Scott Hyten. Scott Hyten is a professional photographer that was there in the beginning when Apple Computer started uh, doing panoramic uh, uh, photography and uh, immersive imagery uh, with QuickTime VR. Uh, Scott, in the subsequent uh, decade or so, has uh, established a number of techniques that help improve a lot of the quality and um, aesthetics of uh, uh, resulting panoramic uh, photographs. And today we have the opportunity of having him uh, talk about those techniques. He is also in the process of uh, finishing up a book on panoramic photography, and I'm sure he'll be talking a little bit about that. There's also a few uh, brochures around for related kinds of equipment that you uh, might want to take a look at. Um, but uh, without further ado, I'd like to bring up Scott Hyten. Thank you, Ken, and good morning. Um, how many of you here have, uh, have done panoramic photography or done VR at all? Oh, good. Most of you. That's nice. Good. So uh, the rest of you, are you just new to it, interested? Yeah? Thought it'd be fun to, to figure out what's going on. Um, it, it really is a neat technology. I was, uh, as Ken mentioned, I had the opportunity to be one of the first uh, at Apple when they were, were putting together uh, QuickTime VR technology. And when I first saw it, you know, I was going, wow, as a photographer, this is, this is you know, the next best thing uh, since sliced bread. So um, since then, and, and I was not an Apple employee, I was an independent contractor. I've been a photographer for, you know, years before that. And it just opened up a whole world of possibilities. And as a photographer, these VR technologies sort of expand your mind and your creativity, the, the areas that you can go. And so I've had a lot of fun with it. Um, we'll talk first a little bit about the, the visual impact of, of VRs. Let me get some sound here. Um, and, and how they can work. Most, you, most of us, unfortunately, are familiar with VR technology by seeing um, home tours you know, on real estate sites. And those are probably the lowest caliber of <laughs> panoramas out on the market because they're done quick, they're done, done dirty. I've always strived to do something a little more creative and a little better than that and to use a little bit higher quality te technologies as well. But when you have a, uh, you can have a static image, obviously, um, you know, which, which can tell a whole story, but having a panoramic view allows you to see so much more and to explore more interactively than you would otherwise. Uh, this is actually a, a panorama done on the uh, side of Mount Kenya at a high camp in Africa. Um, it was done as a night shot, so these are five-minute exposures giving you star trails and things. But I also like the idea of doing something that you could get a little more immersed in, so we kept the tripod set up overnight and um, did similar shots at dawn. And, oops, went to the wrong direction there. And during daylight. So you can have lots of fun with it. You can still explore each one, pan panning around go back and forth, these are all linked together. It's also used commercially. A lot of companies are now using it for their facilities brochures or their facilities promotions. So this was, was down at um, a communications company down in San Jose. One of their control rooms, a satellite control room, it's Global Star, it was actually the phone company. It allows you to see the, if I'm panning too fast, let me know. Some people get kind of sick and dizzy watching them when they, when they pan by too fast. But of course you can zoom in and you can zoom out in any part of these. I also like being able to take viewers places that they might not normally go or to show them things that they might not normally see or may not yet understand. And certainly in this case, uh, this was a NASA wind tunnel down at uh, Moffett Field. It was a Mach 3 wind tunnel that had been shut down. We spent about three days lighting it and setting it up, but uh, you know, created a very nice image showing you know, the environment and how it worked. And again, you can zoom in on parts of it, zoom out. This was a uh, uh, panorama done in, whoops, sorry, it's a little loud. 
uh, in one of the NOAA P3 Orions, the Hurricane Hunter that they have flying. And I actually got to fly on an assignment with them and did a whole series of panoramas to do a tour through the plane while it was going on one of its missions. And you can travel you know, back to other positions and see what's going on in the, the rest of the plane, keep traveling backwards, you know, looking around, go back forwards, back to the cockpit, you know, sit in the, the pilot's seat if you want, fly it. Fun stuff, I think. Underwater in the Galapagos, Galapagos sea lions on a reef. This is a fun shoot that I did with uh, uh, Mountain Travel Sobek uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, we did a whole virtual Galapagos tour where we uh, um, were doing live broadcasts every day during this expedition down there. A little bit closer to home, this is the Fitzgerald Marine Reserve over on the coast here in San Mateo County. And uh, it's simply a tide pool. Put the camera underwater in a, a relatively shallow tide pool get to show the environment there, which most people who visit will see from the surface looking down, but actually putting the camera in the water is, is a nice way to show what's going on under there. It can also take us to places that most of us will never go to, such as the side of El Capitan in Yosemite. Gives us the opportunity to look around, see what it's really like being up on the, the edge of the cliff like that or the side of the, the rock face. You can look out into the valley, zoom in, zoom back out. If you really want to get nauseous, you can look straight down and see how high you are. So getting into the technical side of things, when we talk about panoramas, we're, we're talking about a number of different um, dimensions. And to understand this, uh, we'll talk about the horizontal dimension first, which is the uh, field of view in the x direction. Um, we call panoramas, partial panoramas, if they're less than 360 degrees around. So if you're seeing less than a full circle, refer to that as a partial panorama. If you're seeing 360 degrees or more, you're seeing what we call a full panorama. And sometimes, you know, photographers will use a greater than 360 degree view in case you want to show, you know, something changing as you pan around. Uh, I think Ken actually did one years ago. Was it a Paris subway uh, stairwell? Yeah, where it was 2,500 degrees, and basically he did a panorama up the stairs of all the 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 artwork, the murals on the wall that went up this spiral staircase. And it was really, it, it was quite dynamic. Um, so that you, can, you can use these, you know, the technology, all sorts of fun ways. You just have to be creative with it. The next element is the vertical field of view. And this is where early technology, the early QuickTime VR was limited. Um, we're generally limited by the field of view that our camera's lens can capture. Uh, in most instances, uh, with, with the early technologies, this was restricted to about 110 degrees, maybe 120 degrees, because that physically is, is as wide as you can design a camera lens that is corrected, that has rectilinear correction. And rectilinear correction means that your straight lines stay straight. You know, it's not a fisheye warped view or, or curved view at all. Um, and then these images, these panoramas, were projected into virtual cylinders. The cylinder was chosen because it was, it's the easiest mathematically and the simplest mathematically to, um, you know, to project and, and to do all the computations based on what computers people had available at the time. They were, they were pretty limited relative to what we have today. So when you're stitching an image or when you're shooting most uh, panoramas, the, the common way to do it is to shoot a series of still images around in a circle, all 360 degrees. You have overlap in between each one of them. Then you stitch each image together, uh, matching the pixel patterns in the overlap area, and then you blend it and you create the seamless panorama. So rules for that are you generally want to have your images overlap by a third to a half. You generally want to pan left to right. Why is that? It's because we tend, in the English-speaking uh, countries, we tend to read left to right. Uh, 
Most of the early software was set up to stitch left to right. You can do it the opposite way now if you're shooting, but you're usually going to have to reverse things as you're, as you're putting your, uh, uh, doing your post-production. So just get in the habit of shooting left to right. It's, it's the way we read, so do it that way. It'll, you'll save yourself a lot of headaches later on. You want to keep everything constant between shots. The only thing you want to change is the direction that you're shooting. That means you want your exposure to stay the same, your white balance, your focal length if you've got a zoom lens. Uh, you don't want that to change and you want your focus to, change, uh, to stay constant as well. Because if they move, if they adjust at all, you're gonna wind up with stitching errors. You'll have areas, uh, your pixel patterns that may match up physically but the color is different. So you'll see a, a, a um, a visible seam there where, where the changes have occurred. Uh, if you change focus, <clears throat> or if you zoom at all, or your camera zooms because it's on automatic, it too will have problems matching those pixel patterns throughout the area. So set everything on manual when you're shooting uh, these stitched images. Keep them that way. Tripods, very good idea. <laughs> it is possible to shoot handheld panoramas. There are some people who do it extremely well. Uh, but you really want to know what you're doing and understand you know, alignments and, and what's going to happen in the stitching process later. So generally, you want to make sure you have a tripod, set the camera on it, you know, al align your nodal point and go. Nodal point alignment, uh, hang on a second, oh, we'll get to in just a minute, uh, but this is going to be a critical element to shooting stitched panoramas successfully so that they stitch smoothly. Yes, I'm sorry, what was the question? Ken, how did you shoot the spinal staircase, spiral staircase shot? Yeah, the, the nodal point alignment is not so critical when all of your subjects are distant from the camera, but as they get closer, um, you get a more of a parallax error as you pan between them, so they're changing their relative positions in the viewfinder or on the film, film plane. So it, it's pretty important when you're doing ultra-wide shots that you know, have stuff in the, in the foreground that you need to keep aligned. There are a number of stitching applications out there, some, some very good software ones. Um, some of them that I have listed here, the Apple QuickTime VR Authoring Studio is no longer supported or sold by Apple, but it's still one of the, the best stitchers around. It only runs on Mac under classic mode, uh, but I still use it fairly regularly. There are others like PTGUI, uh, which is probably the best and the most reasonably priced one out there in my experience as well. RealViz Stitcher is also a good one. Uh, a bunch of these are available on both Mac and Windows uh, platforms. So, uh, you know, try a few of them. A lot of them have free downloads that you can do trial periods on and test them out for yourself. Uh, getting back to the nodal point alignment. Uh, what is a nodal point? Uh, most camera lenses, or all camera lenses, I think have, it's six nodal points or nodal planes. Are there any optical engineers here? No, well, it's something like that. The, and the only one we care about is what they call the rear nodal point. And that's where you have the light coming in the lens. Let's see if I can get my mouse going here. When the light comes in the lens, it gets inverted as it goes through the lens and is projected onto the film plane or the digital sensor upside down. It's the point at which that light all crosses in the center. Okay, the point within the lens where all that comes together, that's the nodal point, and that's where you want to have the axis of your camera's rotation aligned over, and that's, that's important. I'll show you a little later uh, how that works, uh, or why that's important. Uh, to do this, you generally need to have a VR pan head, and this allows you not only to put the camera in a vertical position, but to adjust the, the camera's position relative to that axis of rotation, both in the forward and sideways directions. And here's what happens when you have nodal points that are not lined up properly. In this case, 
you, you won't notice it just looking at the images unless you're knowing what to look for. You'll see there's a, a little handheld radio in the foreground here in both these pictures. And the radio hasn't moved, but its relative position to the doorway in the background has. See how there's a small gap right here and a large gap right here? Nothing changed as I was taking the picture. You know, the scene remained the same. It's just the nodal point of the camera was, or the lens was off. It wasn't lined up over the axis of rotation. So those two subjects relative to one another from the camera's viewpoint change their positions. The result is you get a stitching error over here when you assemble it. You know, all the light and everything looks fine, but you see you get these ghosted images, you know, you get ceilings that don't line up properly here. So this is important to, to do. So when you actually have the lens aligned properly, as you pan, you see these, this gap or this relationship between foreground and distant subjects remains the same and the stitch works pretty well. So next thing to be concerned about, most of us are shooting digitally these days, particularly for panoramas, um, are our sensor sizes and how much of the, the view we're actually capturing with our cameras. For a 35 millimeter film frame, and this is where everything started out, you know, we, fields of view calculations are generally done based on a 35 millimeter film frame size. Uh, you see the entire frame that's captured in the film. With the newer cameras and generally the more expensive professional digital cameras, they have full frame image sensors. And for, for VR photographers or panoramic photographers, this is a godsend finally, because uh, you get to see you, the, the coverage of the film or the, the digital sensor is very similar to the size of the 35 millimeter film frame. In this case, this is a new Nikon D3, uh, which was announced a, a month or two ago. It'll be out next month. Um, it has a full frame or very close to full frame digital sensor. Some of the Canon, I think two of the Canon models currently have that also. Um, and so you capture the full fields of view. If you're using most SLR digital cameras today, they have a smaller image sensor that crops down. So your fields of view are significantly reduced. And in this case, this is the Nikon D2X, the D200, most of the Canon cameras as well. Uh, so you, you know, you're really not capturing that, uh, that full scene that you need there. Uh, so you have to shoot a lot more images in order to stitch them together, uh, and, and it causes some, some problems. It still works quite well, but you have, this is a magnification factor of about one and a half times. So your 24 millimeter wide angle lens effectively becomes a 36 millimeter lens uh, in its focal length. Yes? Yeah, how is that just, just practice, realizing that you're using a different lens or, or, or zooming and all the same? Right. Well, well when you're shooting panoramas, for the most part, you're wanting to get as wide a field of view as you can, okay? Because you want to be able to see up, you want to be able to see down, usually. <laughs> you know, if you're shooting the savanna in Africa and all the animals are off in the distance, a long telephoto would be a great way to, to um, shoot a panorama. But generally, we're wanting to see as wide a view as we can. So when you're cropping down, you, you know, your film frame or your, your digital sensor is cropping these, uh, the effective focal lengths of these down. Suddenly, all that money you spent on these ultra wide lenses, you know, the 18 millimeters, the 15 millimeters and all is just, you know, it's not working for me. I'm, I'm, it's like shooting with a 24 now. So that becomes very restrictive. Uh, so these new full frame sensors have really been, uh, they're very welcome for pa panorama photographers. <laughs> So anyway, you can see that's a pretty significant uh, loss of, of, of the field of view, uh, even on very good cameras otherwise. So we talk about fields of view in both directions, the X direction, the horizontal, or the Y direction. It doesn't matter whether the camera's turned horizontally or vertically. Um, we still have, you know, Y is vertical, X is, is uh, horizontal. Now, when we're shooting panoramas, generally, we will turn the camera vertically. Why? That gives us a greater vertical field of view. I can shoot more shots, you know, around the circle. Instead of every 30 degrees, I might do it every 20 degrees because I've got the reduced, you know, the small side um, horizontally. But I want to be able to capture that vertical field of view and to maximize that. So I'll turn the camera on its side uh, or in the portrait orientation. 
as well. And this is why if you have the, the top shot, the top panorama there is shot with, it's an old Nikon Coolpix camera, um, doesn't have a very wide lens, and it's shot in vertical orientation, I can see the tops of things, like the Golden Gate Bridge, things that might be important. If I shoot horizontally, I get the bottom result, because my vertical field of view has now been reduced to the horizontal um, dimension that way. There are charts, then a bunch of these, there are these, whoops, these are available online. You know, there are calculators. I think Ken's got some on his site that tell you what the fields of view are for various lenses. Uh, you can put your particular camera in and all. But it just, uh, I just show this because it shows you what your fields of view are with a wider focal length. In the 14, 15, and 18 millimeter range, you have, you know, a pretty broad um, field of view. These are, this chart here is for a 35 millimeter or full frame sensor. Uh, what happens, so if you go down, let's say you have a 24 millimeter lens down here that you're using on a, a 35 millimeter camera, you get a 73 degree vertical field of view. This is in portrait orientation. If you're using uh, a digital SLR that's got a smaller sensor on it, uh, and you have a 1.5 times magnification factor, then your 24 millimeter is essentially becoming a 36 millimeter lens. So you've got about 50 degrees of vertical coverage rather than the, the 70 plus. So, and you don't have to worry about this. this. This sort of charts, you know, they're available online. We actually at the VR photography site have a little uh, slate book that includes this and a bunch of other charts. So you can always look them up. Um, this, this may become important with some stitchers because they will ask you what lens you were using so they can calibrate the stitching properly. Um, so you want to know what the equivalent is even if you're not using, you know, even if you're not getting the, uh, the, the exact number. So it has a place to start. Uh, the, cil the cylinders are used, this is just to give you an idea, when, when Apple first started with QuickTime VR, they used the cylindrical model. Uh, and it's very good because it's, it's a simple one to calculate, but its limit is that vertical field of view for displaying the panoramas as well. And as you can see, as the vertical field of view that it's showing, as the height or the, the dimension of the, the angle, the viewing angle, the vertical viewing angle increases, the amount of data that you have to provide to fill that cylinder with images increases almost geometrically. In fact, as it approaches 180 degrees, so you can see straight up and straight down, you reach an infinite amount of data, an infinite cylinder size. So there are, that's why other technologies, other projection systems have been de developed since then. So how do, you, how do you shoot and stitch? You shoot a series of 12 images. In this case, this was done with a 18 millimeter uh, lens on a uh, Nikon film camera. And that's done with a head. This one in particular is a Kaidan head that, as you can see as it rotates, the lens, the nodal point of the lens remains aligned over the rotation axis. And these heads all have, the, they can be used on many different camera and lens combinations because all of these posts and things slide so you can adjust yours, uh, you know, to, to fit your own uh, setup. How much do those heads sell for? The heads, uh, th there are a bunch of different models out there and they range anywhere from, I don't know, I think Nodal, Nodal Ninja has one for a hundred and something dollars. This Kaidan one uh, is now an older model, but their new one I think goes for seven or eight hundred dollars. Uh, there are others that are, um, you know, $1,500 or so. So there's a broad range and construction and the designs are, are all different. Uh, but again, the important thing is it allows you to do this, to do this nodal point alignment and to keep everything set while the camera is in a vertical position. It'd be much easier if it was just horizontal. You wouldn't have to have all these arms, you know, sticking out the side. And then once you're finished, the stitcher actually takes all of these individual rectilinear images that don't look like they match up. You know, you look at the edges here, but it takes them, blends them, warps them, and, and overlays them so that they give you the seamless panorama below. Another option, which uh, is 
fairly new, it's been the last few years, are the parabolic uh, mirror attachments for your camera lenses. These actually allow you to shoot an entire 360 degree panorama in one shot. And that's very useful when you're doing uh, scenes that have action in them where things are moving and you, know, you don't want to have somebody you know, jumping here in the one shot, but then they're not you know, there in the next shot as you pan to the, the right, so, which will cause a stitching error because you can capture everything at once. Um, they're pretty slick. They're a little bit limited in their, um, their resolution because you're cramming all this data into one shot. Yes, I'm sorry, in the back. Yes, it has been, yeah, and Be Here had it, you know, a long time ago as well. I think they had it probably 10 years or so ago. Um, so there's been a lot of work and experimentation in it. Uh, this is one, I think the 361 has been out for, I don't know, four or five years or so. Um, but anyway, they create a torus-shaped image or a donut-shaped image, and then with the software that comes with it, uh, you can de-warp it and get a full-frame panorama. Next one is to use a cylindrical, um, oh, I'm sorry, a slit scan rotation camera. A company like uh, Roundshot makes these. Um, and it's pretty slick because the camera actually rotates on a motor and does the pan and uh, then the, it records an image through a slit behind the lens. And then as the camera is panning, so too does the film move. So the film moves at an identical speed to the camera pan based on the projection on the film plane. Yes? Uh, they do. They actually have a whole set of, of uh, camera models that use film. They have a new one, their D3, which is a digital one. And they've made a few digital models before that as well. Yes, a single, single pixel array sensor, yeah. Very cool, and we'll get in, I'll show that a little later on. Anyway, these work pretty neat. They're, they're very beautiful Swiss engineering and Swiss design. Uh, there's a little computer below the, uh, uh, the camera head there, and the, the really neat thing about this design is you can put any focal length lens you want on it, and it will figure out what speed the film needs to rotate at in order to record sharp images as well. So another option, what you can use. So let's get away from the cylindrical viewpoints uh, or the cylindrical captures, which, sorry, this is taking a little bit to load. So this is a panorama shots in um, Washington, DC. Sorry, it's running a little slow. There we go. At the Lincoln Memorial. And it's a nice shot. You know, it gives you a good view and it probably shows you almost everything you would want to see. But if you do a cubic, you're limited, I'm sorry, you're limited on how far up or down you can pan. A cubic version allows you to look straight up, look straight down, and still all the way around as well. There are different ways of capturing these. You can use fisheye lenses, you can use multi-row uh, uh, so, or panoramic capture uh, with traditional lenses. Uh, the two different projection types that are used are the spherical projection where it's, the image is projected in a virtual sphere versus a virtual cube. For our purposes, we don't care. <laughs> they look the same to the end viewer. If you're a programmer and you're designing you know, these, these displays, yes, you do care, but the rest of us, I just need to get the full coverage, you know, as a photographer, uh, vertically and, and uh, horizontally. These are the different, uh, the results for the different kinds of lenses we'll use for it. On the left is an eight millimeter Nikkor, which is called a true fisheye. And it's a true fisheye because the entire image circle is contained within the film or the digital sensor frame. The 16 millimeter or the full frame fisheye is, has a similar fisheye characteristics of the curved lines around the edges and the distortion that way. But its image circle is large enough to fill the entire film frames. And what you do is, is you lose a little bit off the edges compared to the, the eight millimeter over here. You can't see you know, the part that's cropped off by the edges of the film frame here. Uh, but it's still a very valuable lens for, for shooting um, large field of view panoramas particularly now that we have stitchers that can handle fisheye views. 
On the right is a 15 millimeter rectilinear lens. This is one of uh, Nikon's widest. Their, I think their current one is a 14 millimeter. Their widest rectilinear lens. And a rectilinear lens simply means that the lines are corrected. So that you have straight lines in real life are projected on your film plane as straight lines across where the lights are up top. Uh, the vertical lines don't have curves in them as well. And the fields of view are significantly limited on the rectilinear lens design. The another advantage to fisheye lenses is you don't have so much light fall off towards the corners and the edges. Uh, these are just an idea of the, the fields of view and what you can uh, uh, accomplish and why I particularly like the, the full frame fisheye because it gives me 135 degree vertical field of view which is enough for most everything that you shoot except for the Sistine Chapel or looking over the edge of a cliff. Um, I don't feel limited when I'm doing that like I do with a 15 millimeter or, or a, uh, a 14 millimeter. In most environments, like if you come into this room, you look around and you see, well, if I'm going to shoot a panorama, do I really care about the ceiling? You know, I've got you know, various duct work or I've got acoustical tiles or whatever. That's not terribly interesting. The carpet on the floor is not terribly interesting either. So you don't always need a full spherical view. Um, and so you choose your tools accordingly. This is the model that IPix or Internet Pictures originally had uh, uh, claimed as theirs, uh, where you shoot with two 8 millimeter or true fisheye images, opposing hemispheres, and then you abut them together and display them uh, as the entire spherical panorama around you. Uh, another way to do it, <coughs> excuse me to capture these spherical images is to use the, the scanning digital cameras. And the scanning digital cameras uh, have the advantage of, as we were talking about earlier, of having a single pixel wide sensor. So they're only capturing the images at, at one, one pixel row at a time or column at a time. This allows them to use fisheye lenses on there. So you can, with a scanning digital camera, you can capture a full 180 degree vertically by 360 degree image around without any blurring or distortion. On a film scanning camera, they go through a slit that has a certain width to it. And as you saw on the fisheye lenses, there's a curved perspective up at the top. So as you get to the extremes of the, the, um, the edge of the frame, those will blur as they're moving because they'll move up and down as the camera pans and they're not staying in a consistent spot. So these are, are, are extremely valuable, they're also extremely expensive. Uh, uh, Roundshot makes one, Panascan down in uh, Southern California makes another one. I think they're in the thirty to fifty thousand dollar range each. So uh, the automotive industry uses them, a lot of car shooters uh, have gone to these. Uh, law enforcement uses Panascan quite a bit now. They're extremely high resolution. They can capture a crime scene and you know it's it's it, there's a lot of detail captured in it. So they can be very useful. Um, the, the option that I really like now is to use the full frame fisheye lens and basically stitch these images together. And instead of shooting a dozen images around in a circle, I can only, I only need to shoot six images. And then if, if I need it, if I need to be able to look straight up and straight down, I can also shoot the, the zenith shot and the nadir shot. Shooting multiple row panoramas is pretty simple. You tilt the camera up, you shoot a series of images around the circle, and you tilt it back to horizon, and you tilt it down low. In this case, you know, this is for an 18 millimeter Nikkor uh, rectilinear lens. Um, you know, it's 45 degrees up, hard, uh, level with the horizon, and 45 degrees down. You can also, uh, you know, once you've got your three uh, rows that are set up, you can shoot a zenith shot as well as a nadir shot below. Um, if you have a longer focal length lens, you might need to shoot more rows. So instead of 45 degrees up, you might need to be 60 degrees, then 30 degrees, then even. So these really uh, add up. There's a lot of, of imagery that you wind up having to shoot. Uh, in this case, we're using a pan head. Again, this one is from Kaidan, but it allows you to tilt the camera up and down while the nodal point remains aligned with both axes. So you have a rotation axis down here, and then you have 
That's the vertical rotation axis and then the horizontal rotation axis that goes along here. And the nodal point has to remain aligned on both of those as you're doing these. They can be a little bit labor intensive. So when you're shooting one, you start out and I will usually shoot a slate at the beginning of each shot. Uh, this slate contains information, uh, what lens I'm using, you know, the exposure, just because I like to know what that is, uh, what my panoramic sequence is, and I'm going to want to know that when I go to use a stitcher later on, and, and I won't remember for, you know, 20 different shoots. Um, I want to have this recorded with my, my digital files or with my film. Uh, in this case, it was, you know, 12 shots up on three different rows each. So this is what you go through shooting a multi-row panorama. That's our first row, up 45 degrees. The second row is shots horizontal. And you see there's overlap in both directions, both vertically and horizontally. <clears throat> Once you're finished with all that, the stitcher blends everything together. Now in this case, you can see I also moved, because it's a 360 degree panorama, I liked having this half dome that's shot on the left side, I was able to rotate it around after the stitching process and compose the image. So it was a nice image to look at just as a flat panorama. Now I happened to, when I shot this, I was envisioning it as a black and white image. So I actually shot it both ways. And in reality, I, I never even scanned the black and white image because I just converted the color and, and got the result that I wanted. But I was seeing it as, as an image that I wanted to keep or to put up on the wall. And indeed, it makes a nice wall print. Yes? It seems as if, I don't know how often this is exploited by professional photographers, but it seems as if you really want a dramatic black and white shot, you should always shoot in color because you have tremendous latitude in the black and white image. Yeah, the, the, the comment was, why ever shoot in black and white? You know, because you can convert digitally uh, from color to black and white, and then we, that way you've got both. And I think that's a good point. There are some purists who say, you know, I get a certain quality of look out of black and white film. Now, if you're shooting digitally, I don't know too many black and white digital cameras. There are some that you can convert to infrared, um, you know, by removing the filters and things. But I, I think you're right. Um, in this case, this was a long hike, long trek into this spot in Yosemite. Uh, I wanted to have the very lightest equipment I, I could carry, and I also didn't want to have to rely on a digital camera that was more subject to bumps and dust and things like that. So I was shooting film because it was very small and lightweight, and it was just my choice at the time. Today, you know, things are a little bit more reliable. I would uh, probably pretty easily choose, choose a digital camera and just shoot it. This is the result, what you get when you make your movies. Um, you can do it in black and white. It's the black and white version. It allows you to look around. Or you can use the color one, which allows you to see everything in color. Now, I don't know. I should probably take a little poll. What's your preference here? What do you guys like more? Uh, color? Everybody likes color? OK. And, and that's fair. And I found that for the print, the wall print, I like the black and white version better than the color one. It just, it grabbed me more. But for the movie, I like the color version better. So think about this as you're shooting also. So I think multipurposing, you know, what, how can I use these panoramas? How can I use these images later? You may even find yourself as you're shooting the individual elements of a panorama, aligning them so that that shot by itself can be something useful to you. You know, it's, it's framed properly. If you're orienting your camera as you, as you start a panoramic sequence, orient it so that the first shot or the sixth shot or whatever is in a spot that would make a nice shot on its own because you may want that someday. And you know, think multi-use. Uh, just a, a quick reminder, when you're going back to choose your tools, we'll go back to these images on your fields of view, okay? What are you gonna need to shoot? What's gonna be important for you? Um, I find that it's better to choose your stitcher. Choose the software application that you're gonna use first, and then 
go and decide what equipment you're going to need to, to do it that way. That involves deciding, do I need a full 360 by you know, 180 panorama, or am I just going to deal with a cylindrical one? You know, is it a horizontal uh, more a viewpoint better? Um, and then after that, I'll go and I'll choose the camera, the lens, you know, whether I'm shooting digital or film, all, all those other things. Um, most of us will at some point do this backwards, particularly as you're starting out when you say, well, I only have, you know, I've got this camera and I've got this lens, so what can I do to, to use it? And that's perfectly fine. But as you start expanding and say, you know, this isn't working for me anymore, there are more things I want to do, go find your stitching application first. Play with a bunch of them, see which ones you like, and then figure out what its limitations are and what, or what its uh, you know, features are that you can exploit, and then choose the new equipment that you're, you're going to acquire based on, on that. I also want to think about how are you going to light things, you know, other things that are going to happen on the locations where you are actually shooting. Now, I'm going to show you a, a brief video on how all this gets put into practice. Uh, this was a shoot that we actually did down at Global Star uh, in San Jose a short while ago. And you can see what happens behind the scenes. Our assignment was to shoot a series of 360 degree VR panoramas showing the facilities and technology backbone for a global satellite telecommunications company. The company's goal was to be able to show their resource and technology commitment to their potential clients. The VR scenes were to be used on CD-ROMs, the company's website, and in interactive kiosks. Due to the different user interfaces involved, we were asked to shoot every panorama in QuickTime VR, IPix, and high-resolution formats. That's a 45. Don't shoot me throwing gear into the back, okay? I'll do it gently, all the time. It was a very typical corporate VR shoot which required lots of preparation and planning, but also a willingness to modify those plans once on location. The, there's a Pentax 67 uh, 35mm fisheye. Some lenses will actually have a filter holder in the back. This one doesn't, so we'll just have to tape it on. But we'll put a magenta gel on the back of the lens to color correct for the fluorescent lights. Uh, what's bugging me is the vertical lines there, they're just sort of, you know, it's like a blind, it doesn't quite fit. Yeah, just go to the top of the, is that going to hold okay? Yeah, take a smaller one and go up top. You can tell this is a little dated. We're using Polaroid to test things. <laughs> So as with Polaroid, that doesn't change the color balance very much, but it does a little bit. These are a lot. Yeah, we did add a stop, but see this monitor looks really good there, the big monitor. We blew it out there. Okay, well we'll go with the 30 magenta filtration on everything. So everything up here we are going to see, and we are going to pick up glare and uh, you know, reflections off these lights down here with a fisheye lens. The rectilinear linear lens for QuickTime VR will be a lot better. What we're doing now, you're seeing what we're seeing through the Venetian blinds mm -hmm. in this room from there. Right. So we're closing these blinds. What we're going to do is to light this fairly bright in here so that there's kind of a red glow going okay. through the blinds and you're not seeing a lot of detail in here. Like sure. You know, so you'll just there. see the lines? Right. Yeah, just to kind of cover up this room since we don't have people sitting sure. here or anything. Let's try that. I'm big on red. Oh, yeah. See, that's what happens when you let your kids into your, your grip case. All your good stuff disappears. Okay, stand by. 
can do is if we can feather it, yeah, down that way so that this angle coming up here is more up into the ceiling. Good. Ooh, I'm falling. You have to sort of picture the transition sure. as you come and, yeah. around there. So as you pan around from this sort of bright area, it's going to go to this neutral mm -hmm. area in there and then the darker area in the back. It's a subtle difference. But I think I think it'll work fine. I get safe when I was off. Is there some chips or cookies left in there? We could uh, offer these guys. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of cookies were they? Yeah. And we'll be able to link. What we plan to do is link to yeah, the. Yeah. So that you'll just you'll click, click and then you go to the next room. To that right. Room. Okay. Uh, and then. Yeah. yeah we have a lot of Wi-Fi friends. Very well. Shooting. So that was a brief look at, at what goes in. That's a full day shoot to basically do two, two panoramas in a corporate environment where everything is critical. They will really want to be able to see details and, and everything balanced properly in color and all. Again, this is when we were shooting on film, so it was a little bit harder then than it is now with you know auto white balancing on digital cameras. This can go a little bit faster now. This was the result. However, we wound up with these panoramas that showed this was a uh, satellite control room that they have for their, their satellites. You can look all the way around. See everything. Hey, do you notice that, remember that red gel that we were putting on in that room in the background? That's the room, it turned blue. Well, it was because the, fortunately the client was there, the art director for the client was there. And after we had set it up, they said, you know, we're really having a problem with the red because red to me is like alarms. There's something wrong. Okay. So they said, can we change that? Well, yeah, we just put a different gel over it. I love having clients there <laughs> because they give you input like this, trying to fix Venetian blinds colors in Photoshop after the fact would have been a nightmare. It could be done, but it would have taken a long time. So uh, again, this links. So this is the ground control room over here. So you click on the doorway and it takes you into that room. And you look around. So this was showing their facilities that they were trying to show off at the time. And then you can click back and go into the, the first room. Now, that was the QuickTime VR version of it. Yes? Uh, you know, I'm totally new to this thing, so maybe it's a stupid question. But it's very nice to be able to you know, pan around. But the effect of things moving and you know getting deformed during the motion is mm -hmm. really awkward to me. Is it something that can be done just as a user? Yeah, th there is. It's actually done when you're creating the movie, uh, and it's an option you get in your your uh, your your applications, your software applications. Um, you can either have correction on, which gives you that rectilinear correction of the cylinder as it's, you know, panning, or you can turn it off. So you just see, you know, things are, are pretty static and, and they don't change their shape. That's, yeah, that's also more noticeable at very wide views when you've zoomed out than it is a telephoto view or the, the longer view. So for instance here, if we're looking at this one, you see the shape of the screens up here are changing as we go, but as I zoom in, that's now minimized, right? Yeah. Because my field of view and my perspective on it has, has changed. So yes, the user can control it at that level, but it's actually the, the author who's controlling whether that correction is there or not. I like it, you know, because it, it gives me the sense that, oh, I actually am turning in an environment, I'm turning my head and seeing it, rather than there's just a picture sliding by in front of me. So, you know, different people, different tastes, but yes, you can do it, yes. Very high 
Yeah, and, and that's something you can also control. Uh, some of these are older movies that I you know, created based on the need at that time. Um, you can set it so it remains at high resolution uh, and you don't see quite so much distortion. There are newer viewers out there. You see there's a little bit of a jitter on these also as you pan. There are some newer viewers out there that are really slick. They're, they're not accepted on every browser automatically. You sometimes have to download you know, uh, plugins. Uh, but they're very smooth, and you know, you look at it and you go, "Wow, that's just beautiful." Um, and I'm not quite using those yet because I want them to become fully accepted before I start pushing clients, you know, towards that. But yes, there is some distortion. There are limitations to this. Um, certainly, when you're looking at it, you know, at web resolution, it's going to be lower than it would be if you were using it in a, in a you know, presentation. And all. So this was the. Uh, I showed you the QuickTime VR version. This was the IPix version or the fisheye version that we did also. It allows you to look straight up and straight down, which in this instance, you know, I didn't see a lot of value in. You know, I want to see pretty much what's around me. This is a room very much like the room that we're in now, you know, the stuff that's straight up and straight down, it doesn't matter. But the client wanted us to shoot every possible way we could, so we did. Um, and ultimately, they wound up using the cylindrical QuickTime VR version for their presentation because they saw the same thing. You know, do we really want to show a boring, you know, boring ceiling up there? It's 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 not critical. When you're on location shooting, um, I try to find ways to show to show the environment, you know, in an interesting way. Any idiot can basically go in, stick a tripod in the middle of a room or a middle of you know, a, a field or whatnot and shoot a panorama now. It's very simple to do. So you need to have a perspective. You need to have a story that you want to tell. There's something in that scene that you want to show or you want your viewers to know about. So you want to highlight it. And part of doing that means positioning yourself or your camera in a place where it will show you know, interesting things in the foreground. Uh, this was actually a shoot that I did for a, a, an outdoor clothing or product company up in Seattle. We shot for about three days. And the last day, you know, they needed this canoe shot where they're, you know, the guys, the models wearing their, their jackets and, you know, holding a GPS unit in their hand and all. And it involved, you know, to make it interesting and thinking about a 360 degree view that didn't have, you know, ugly parking lots or, or things, you know, in part of the scene, you had to get down low and you had to get in the water, basically. And to me, that's kind of fun. That's fun stuff to do. You know, you're, you're not just standing in a room shooting a picture. Um, in this instance, I shot this with a fisheye lens. We were doing IPix format. The client wanted that at the time. I tend to shoot when I'm doing full frame fish eyes, rather than shooting two opposing hemispheres, I'll shoot a series of four. So I get, instead of every 180 degrees, every 90 degrees. That gives me the option if a first hemisphere pair doesn't work for some reason. <clears throat> Let's say there's a lens flare or something that I missed, or they just didn't line up properly, they don't abut properly. I've got the second 90 degree you know, version to, to try again. Furthermore, there are some stitchers out there now that allow you to stitch these images. So having an overlap between them is great. So to me, getting four images is an ideal way to do it. Yes? Right. Right. The the question or the comment was if you the, there seems to be an advantage to the IPix approach to things where if you can get two cameras with two fisheye true fisheye lenses on it, you can just put them back to back and and you know shoot everything at once. Yes, you can do that. Um, unfortunately, the alignment of the cameras and the images does not line up properly. There's going to be, because of the space of the cameras, you know, that they take and the lenses take, you're going to have a gap that big between the edges of the images. If there's something important in that area, uh, that's going to be a problem. These Nikkor 8mm lenses 
truly have a 180 degree field of view and it's on some of them it's maybe a little less 179 179 point something uh, other fish eyes uh, you know may have 181 so that gives you a slight overlap or 184 uh, but that still can be very problematic if you've got something in the foreground that might fall in that that dark area which you're not capturing so trying to line those images up later on can can be a nightmare um, unfortunately, I, I don't know how many of you have kept up with this, but the IPIX Corporation went out of business a year ago. Um, all their assets were sold off, they went bankrupt. So this technology, you know, still exists, but it's, um, you know, it's not, we don't really call it the IPIX technology anymore. Uh, it can be used, you know, the many other companies are, are, you know, providing stitchers and software applications that do the same thing. There were a bunch of patents suits and everything you know that that happened over the years there was a very sordid uh tale but uh that's pretty much over now and and you know you can use these tools almost any way you want so it, it was funny on this shoot i was um we, we had shot for a couple of days already in various locations around Seattle, and this was the early in the morning on the third day, last day, and the art director hadn't shown up yet. And I, again, I really like having the client or the art director there because they look at stuff and they say, yeah, I like this, I don't. Um, and she finally showed up and, and she stood on this, this dock over here, you know, looked and said hi, and then she left. You know? And I asked her later on after we'd finished the shoot, and. And uh, she said, well, you know, we'd shot together for two days. I showed up at 7.30 in the morning. It was freezing. I needed coffee. And there you were, chest deep in the water. And I just knew that we were in control here. <laughs> it's kind of like, OK, it would have been nice to have you there. But, <laughs> but it's, it's nice when you know, things are working and you're getting creative. And other people can tell. Your clients can, can really tell that, that that's working for you. Um, I think we have time to do this. Uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about lighting on location. You don't have to take big lights with you, but you want to be able to utilize the light that's there to make the image work for you as well as you can. This was that Lincoln Memorial uh, series, and I want to show you how the light changes very quickly at dawn and dusk. This is a 6.30 a.m. shot, um, virtually no light in the sky. Five minutes later, we're starting to see a little bit of glow. And this is getting pretty because you're realizing that you can balance the interior light and the exterior light, and, and there, there's something good happening there. But it goes fast. Five minutes later, it looks like this. Three more minutes later, it looks like this. So these two are kind of where the lighting is working for me. They're balanced. Five minutes after that, now it's starting to get uh, not so interesting. And seven minutes after that, the sky is basically blown out now. You can see it's an overcast, ugly day, and it's not doing a lot for me. And 25 minutes after that first shot, the, the, the day's ruined. I mean, you, you should, you know, you're not going to be shooting this subject now. So, yeah. Is this a problem that I've often had in being outdoors trying to stick together things in the blue sky and in the dark? And that's what you're right. And I've seen there's tools for taking multiple exposures from a single frame. Right. Yeah, certainly it is. In fact, in fact, that kitchen shot that, that I showed earlier, the, the first sequence of stitching, was done that way, where you're shooting interior, and we had no choice but to shoot during the middle of the day. So we couldn't wait till dawn or dusk to, so that the light outside the window was balanced with the light inside. Uh, and you can do multiple exposures. You can you know, assemble them over, over top of each other and to balance those. It's called, uh, there are a lot of tools now called HDR, high dynamic range, where they, you're doing that. You're actually keeping the camera in a fixed position. Uh, it's not moving at all and it's pixel accurate so that you can align these images and the software actually does it automatically. It looks and says, you know, okay, this is the bright one, this is the dark one, and then it takes the dark parts of the bright image and, and you know, assembles it 
so that so that they match with the, the light parts of the dark image. Um, it depends on what software you're using. Some software applications, PTG UI, will actually you can do it within the stitching application in their new version. Uh, when I was using QuickTime VR Authoring Studio, um, I usually would do it to each source image before I stitched that way. So I'm sorry, the, the question was about balancing the lighting between you know, real hot highlight areas and, and real dark interiors. Um, again, when I'm shooting, I wanna try to show whatever subject that I'm showing in an interesting way. How can I make it, how can I immerse my viewers into it? This was a shot that I was actually a personal project that I did. I had this idea that, okay, I wanted to shoot a nighttime, a long nighttime panorama. And, you know, a lot of people, once you figure out how to do long exposures on your camera, you can do star trail pictures. But I wanted to do it as a panorama so that you could actually look all the way around. You know, see the whole sky, see the star trails throughout, see the entire environment. So think about the challenges in doing this. How do you shoot it? You know, and this is the part of the creative process that I love. It's solving the problems. Okay, okay. I could shoot it with multi, you know multi row, but then the star trails aren't going to match up. I could shoot it with a fisheye lens, but then if I shoot a hemisphere this way, the star trails aren't going to match up with this hemisphere. So, what to do on it? And my solution was I tilted the fisheye lens upward, or I lay it on its back so that I was capturing the whole sky in one exposure and then capturing everything below it in the second one. So I rotated the axis of my, my hemisphere pairs and that allowed me to get a three hour long star trail exposure and then another three hour exposure you know, facing the ground. And this one actually required a little more than that. I shot the, the same scene with a camera in the exact same position before it got dark. So there was a little bit of light actually illuminating the, the, you know, the little island there and the lake um, so that I could, again, do the HDR technique where I was bringing out some of the dark shadows by having a lighter exposure on there. And that's always fun. And I love this because this, you know, not only does it show the axis of, your, of the Earth's rotation, but it also shows, um, things that I didn't expect and that I didn't know I would see. In this instance, this, this uh, I think it was middle of summer, it was up in uh, northern Idaho, uh, so we're at a fairly high latitude, and sun was, it was dark out at around 9.30. I waited until 11 o'clock to start the first exposure because I wanted that sky to be really dark. I didn't want any light pollution, you know, coming in and, and interfering. This glow over here, is what's left of the glow in the sky of the sun going down. You know, even though it's well beyond the horizon, it still shows up enough in a three hour exposure. So I thought, well, that was kind of cool. I didn't really expect that, but, but it, it works. And then I was thinking, okay, what's this glow over here? This is looking, well, that's Polaris up there. This is looking north. What the heck? You know, it's not the sun coming up in the east over here. It was something in the north. And, you know, it's not Northern Lights. It wasn't, you know, it just wasn't making sense until I realized and I was remembering back while we were there, there was a forest fire 50 miles away. And this was the glow in the sky from that direction from the forest fire. You don't see that, you know, when you're, when you're there in person because your eyes don't pick it up. But that, that's the exciting part of, of doing, you know, fun stuff like this. I'm going to leave you with one more uh, uh, quick video. It's about seven minutes that uh, describes the... Yeah, I'm sorry, Ken. How do you support the camera when you're taking down shots? A good tripod? <laughs> oh, you, th there's, there's some retouching involved here. When you, you mean the, the, when you're doing the, the nadir shot on multi-row panoramas? Um, or even this <clears throat> south door scene. Yeah, generally there's a lot of retouching done to retouch that, that bottom stuff in. Um, what, what I'll usually do, if I'm not shooting something that's a really long exposure, is I'll shoot everything at, at exposure and then I'll move the tripod away, take the camera back to the position, hand hold it, you know, and 
put my feet way back here and then shoot downward just to get a shot of something that I can that I can stitch in there. Okay, and that allows me to have enough material to do the retouching of the, the bottom there. A lot of people, um, myself included, instead of doing that, will just put a little round, you know, digital tripod cap in there. And it doesn't really bother people. Some people put their logo on it so they know who shot it. You know, it's all in the image. Um, there are a lot of tricks you can use. In the instance of, of uh, this nighttime Star Trail panorama, I actually had the camera set up on a tripod with an arm going out. So the lens was leaning out and the tripod legs were slightly off to the side. And that way the view straight down was clear and all I had to do was retouch, you know, the, the legs out of there that were there. So this is just a, a video to show you um, that Yosemite shoot that I did and I hope you enjoy it. Oops, that's not it. I need to click the wrong button. In April of 1927, Ansel Adams created one of his best-known photographs, entitled Monolith, the Face of Half Dome. Shot from a precipice almost 4,000 feet above the valley floor, the image marked what Adams described as his first conscious visualization, meaning that he accurately planned and visualized the final print in his mind at the time he was creating the image with his camera. Even near the end of his life, he described the experience as being one of the most exciting moments of his photographic career. Generations of photographers have followed in Adams' footsteps, sometimes photographing the same or similar scenes with their own visual interpretations. As a panoramic photographer, I often wondered what we didn't see in Ansel's framing of Half Dome. Upon reaching the summit of the diving board, one stands cautiously in awe of the scene ahead. Almost 3,000 feet of air below, and the massive face of Half Dome continuing for another 1,500 feet above. The thrill of seeing the spectacular view in person is surpassed only by the excitement of realizing what the resulting images on film will yield.
So thank you. That's it. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Dick. So you talked about that nodal point, but uh, the stuff I've read in optical engineering says the point that matters is someone called the front or the, the, uh, the entrance view. It's not a nodal point. Okay, I, I am not an engineer. And uh, I'm not an optical engineer either, and I may be wrong, but I understand that it is the rear nodal point, or what they call the rear nodal point. And I believe that's in, I got that from Focal's Encyclopedia of Photography, and there's another one um, on, 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 optic, on optics. Yeah, it's, it's a good one to look up. Okay, so if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, but it's, what we commonly call the nodal point, and I suspect that it was called that for a reason, but but I could be wrong. I'll check it. Yeah. Yeah. There's other points yeah. Points, but yeah. Kind of well, I know there are two nodal points for the lens, and and it also differs for fisheye lenses versus rectilinear lenses. So if you're shooting with a fisheye lens, you generally want to align. I think the nodal point moves, but you want to align the front field of view of, you know, the, of the lens where you, the images are going to abut, you want that aligned over the axis of rotation rather than a hard to find nodal point. And, and again, it's a little tough to pin it down. Uh, and uh, Yeah, and, and that's, that's a good question also. How do you find the nodal point? Unfortunately, lens manufacturers don't, don't put this on their lens. They don't put a little line you know, marked anywhere and you, you I have never been able to find even printed information from them about where the nodal point is on a given lens. So you do have to do it on your own. You have to put it on a head that you can adjust and there, there are methods to doing this, but basically you pan and you look to see if things are aligning, you move the camera forward or backwards a little more. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good, good way to think about it. But it's, that's interesting because I, I thought I had that one nailed down, so, uh, but I could be wrong. I'll check it now. So, got it. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.